Okay, so let's uh, keep talking about worms. Members of class Clitellata, the earthworms and the leeches. Uh, again, as I mentioned, earthworms traditionally were oligochaeta, leeches were hyurdidae, reorganization. One class for both of them. Uh, what makes earthworms different than the polychaetes or polychaetas is that they lack the parapodia. They still have setae, but the other big feature, let me put the little box, the other big feature for the earthworms and the leeches, why they've reorganized them, is this structure known as the clitellum. So the clitellum is the thickened midsection of the worm or the leech. So this big thick band here, this big thick band here, oh, that is kind of the big defining feature that helps us go, oh, okay, this makes us a member of clitellata, the clitellum. Um, the, that thickened midsection, one of the main things it does is it will secrete mucus and the mucus will be used during mating. When the earthworms go to mate, they, I'll show you a picture in a minute here. They will secrete mucus out of that clitellum and that houses the eggs and the sperm. They create little cocoons and then they drop them in the soil. So, okay, we'll get to that in a bit. So, all right, but the setae are what help the earthworms actually move through soil. And then they have those circular and longitudinal muscles because they have that hydrostatic skeleton. All those structures combine to enable them to move and burrow their way through the soil. Uh, when it comes to mating, earthworms are hermaphrodites. So they're going to release sperm and accept sperm. So they release sperm, produce eggs, get sperm from someone else, etc., etc. So here's a picture of the earthworms mating. They line up, the clitellum releases mucus, and then the sperm, the mucus packet goes to the next worm. They get mutually, the idea is they mutually exchange sperm packets. They receive a sperm packet, they use that to fertilize their eggs, and then they put that into a little mucus cocoon and drop it into the soil and give it enough time. That soil, that little cocoon package here, contains a zygote in it that develops into an embryo, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and you get your little worm coming out of it. So if you guys grab a handful of soil out of the yard, kind of break it apart if it's loomy, kind of loose soil. And if you see those little green, they're not balls, they're more oval shaped, those little green structures in there, those are earthworm eggs or earthworm cocoons that house fertilized eggs inside of them. So we want those. Earthworms are incredibly beneficial. They're huge, huge value environmentally. Uh, here's a cross section just so you get a bigger overview of the earthworm. They do have a head. So find the clitellum, the shorter segment of the worm's body. That's where the head will be located. The longer section at the end, that's where the anus will be located. <clears throat> you chop an earthworm in half? No, it does not live. It does not become two earthworms, not annelids. If we go back to platyhelmets, the flatworms, members of Dugesia, those guys you can cut in half and get two, but not an earthworm. Because think about it, all these look at all these structures. You have a mouth, you have a pharynx, goes into the esophagus, a crop. There's a full digestive system here, complete digestive system. So you chop that worm in half, how the heck is it going to live? So right there, the heart's up here, the major blood vessels are up here, the primary aspects of the circulatory system all lie above or anterior to the clitellum. So what's down here? Digestive system? Okay, that's it. This is not going to become a new worm. So that's one of those big myths people often have about earthworms. Well, I cut in half and now I have two worms and they're both going to live. 
No, they're not. They will move around and wiggle and flop and writhe in pain because there are nerves that go through the entire body of the earthworm. So it's like chopping off the tail of a lizard. It will flip and flop and move around to try to distract the predator, but it's not going to survive. All right. So keep those things in mind when we use worms for fishing or for whatever, what the different parts are. Uh, primarily, the setae will be located on the abdominal side of the worm. They're all sticking down here. And they will use those to dig and burrow and kind of pull their way through the soil. If they're down in the soil and something's trying to pull them out of the dirt, that's supposed to be our worm. No. The sete will lock into the soil. So if you're trying to pull the worm up this way, the sete are locked in and it makes it harder for a predator to actually extract that animal from the soil. That's why the worm will stretch out and stretch out and stretch out. And if you pull too hard, you're going to rip the worm in half. So, but sete are very important for these guys. Uh, they're not going to break off and hurt you like the sete from the polychaetes. Just more, they're more just short, stiffened little hairs. So I'd encourage you guys, get out, play with a worm, Run your fingers across the body. You go in one direction, it feels smooth and slimy. You go the other direction, it feels bumpy and rough because you're going against the direction of the sete. So, uh, again, interesting little creatures. Um, here's some trivia facts. Let me make room here. Earthworms are incredibly valuable economically and ecologically to soil health. You kill your worms, your soil is dead. You do not get good soil. So they will provide a huge role in aeration of soil. Those little tunnels and tubes they create that allows oxygen to move through, allows water to percolate through. Um, they produce incredible amounts of nutrients as they consume decomposing vegetation, decomposing organic material. The nutrients they produce, that comes out in their poop. So earthworms will eat their body weight in about oh, 24 hours. So here's a challenge for all of you guys out there. Everybody in the class, can you eat your body weight in food in the course of 24 hours. So you're 140 pounds, 180, 110, whatever. Could you consume that amount of food in 24 hours? Earthworms do, they consume it. They are considered um, detritivores because they consume broken down organic matter and they consume it, digest it, break it down, consume or absorb some of the nutrients, but then they poop out a lot of the excess nutrients. That is soil. Again, you want earthworms. If you're into farming, gardening, anything with soil, earthworms are incredibly important. So we have to consider when we are spraying pesticides and chemicals on our fields, are we killing the worms? Are we killing the things that will actually create good organic soil for us? And a lot of times the answer is yes, we are with modern agricultural practices. So it's a challenge. How do we benefit ecologically as well as economically? Can we strike a balance? So, all right. The other group that we want to talk about are the leeches. Now they are classified under clitolata. Traditionally, or in some cases, they're still called hyurtidae, but we're going to put them under clitolata. That's where recent classification has moved them. Um, the big key, why are they clitolata? This big thickened midsection right here. All right, now things that make leeches different than earthworms. They will lack the parapodia and the setae. So no hairs on these guys. 
Nothing. Um, leeches are primarily freshwater oops, organisms. They are parasitic. So they find a host, they attach to a host, and they consume nutrients from the blood. Um, some of them are detritivores, where they're going to consume organic material, just decomposing, broken down organic material. But most of the leeches we're going to be exposed to, parasitic little guys. So superficially, at first, we go, oh, these guys suck. I don't like leeches. Ah, stop for a moment. There is a huge medicinal value to leeches. So in order for them to do their job and be parasites, they have posterior and anterior suckers. So there's a suction cup on the head and a suction cup on the bottom. They suction cup onto you. In the head, they have these tiny, tiny little jaws that will slice through your skin. It makes this Y shape. I, mean, I don't know if we can really call it a Y. This structure right here, that's the incision mark of the leech. And then as you bleed, the leech secretes an anticoagulant into the wound. So it stops your blood from flowing or from clotting. I'm sorry. Keeps it flowing, stops it from clotting. So instead of, ooh, I got bit by a leech and now a blood clot forms and the leech can't feed, the anticoagulant prevents the blood from clotting. It's very similar to what mosquitoes produce. So you go, okay, they will suck your blood. Now you think the earthworm was a champ when it came to eating? Leeches can consume 10 times their body weight in 30 minutes. So you try that at, at the next Chinese buffet or Golden Corral or wherever you want to go for an all-you-can-eat pizza buffet. 10 times your body weight in 30 minutes. Crazy to think about it. That's why if you guys go swimming, you stick your feet in the water in a lake, and you're just kind of dangling your feet there, and you take your feet out, you're like, why am I bleeding on my ankle? You had a leech on you and didn't even realize it. The anticoagulant prevents the blood from clotting, keeps flowing, fills the leech up, they swell up, and then they just drop off. Now, how do they find us? They're using their sensory structures to detect carbon dioxide output. So that's how they find their prey. They're looking for carbon dioxide, kind of parallel to a, what a mosquito is doing on land. So some amazing little creatures. Uh, you know, in, in general, we don't like leeches because ugh, they're parasites and they suck our blood, but they do have tremendous medicinal value. So for thousands of years, leeches have been used in medicinal practices to extract blood. Today's modern medicine what leeches can be used for is to actually assist with surgery or healing after microsurgery. So you're a physician, you're trying to attach somebody's finger that got cut off, and you have to put together blood vessels and a tissue. So this is supposed to be a broken blood vessel. And what will normally happen if there's a break here is this will clot. This will build a clot here that could plug the blood vessel up. And now all of a sudden, your blood can't get to this side and the tissue over here dies. So let's say this is the new the fingertip you're trying to reattach that got cut off or damaged or whatever. So what physicians are doing is they're using leeches, attaching leeches to the injury allowing them to dissolve the blood clot. And yeah, the leech is now getting blood and blood's flowing into the leech, but it opens up the clot and allows the blood to flow up to the tissue you're trying to reattach. Huge, huge medicinal value. So we want to keep that in mind when we look at some of these animals.